All right, so welcome. Um, Pi Parallel. So this is the uh, this is going to be the third time that I've presented uh, Pi Parallel since coming up with the concept uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, the uh, the first time I presented it was at uh, Pi Data, New York City, last year around uh, September, October. Uh, I had about 154 slides uh, that I attempted to get through within 45 minutes, uh, and I got kicked off stage after. Uh, <laughs> after 54 minutes, I think, having gotten through about 130 of those slides. Uh, I, the, uh, the most recent presentation that I gave, which this one's based on, uh, again, that was, uh, I, I was kind of like editing slides right up to the presentation. For this particular one, I thought, maybe let's try something different. Maybe let's try spend some time actually back on Pi Parallel uh, and get it working. So the slides are definitely gonna suffer in this one, but on the flip side, I can now demo Pi Parallel. Um, so about me. Uh, I'm a system software engineer by trade, um, specialized in uh, essentially what I've come to having now worked with a lot of data scientists and, and that sort of pedigree of, um, of, I guess, vocation. I've come to appreciate, like, I, I like doing system stuff, low-level stuff, database stuff, OS stuff. That's, I, I'm the most comfortable doing that sort of stuff. Uh, I'm a core Python committer uh, and have been since around 2008 uh, and in a, a, a subversion committer as well, which is super relevant in today's day and age. Uh, so I founded Snakebyte. So Snakebyte is this uh, amorphous mass of uh, gear uh, being hosted at uh, Michigan State University. So my involvement with Python uh, around the 2008 period, uh, I, I actually got involved as a committer because I ended up trying to fix a lot of the build bots and then just fixing different bugs. And long story short, that it, it, it sort of evolved into this little pet project that I created. So I basically built this server room that's running all... Uh, the, the idea was to um, provide more coverage to systems and software that uh, open source developers wouldn't otherwise have access to. So everything you see in that rack is it's basically all Unix gear. And like funky, also super relevant Unix gear like AIX and SGI Eric and all that sort of stuff. Uh, so my background's like 100% Unix. I, uh, that was, you know, what I, I, I feel like a Unix pedigree type of person, but I kind of made my peace with, peace with Windows when, uh, when XP came out. So what is Pi Parallel? Uh, it's a set of modifications to the CPython interpreter, uh, and it essentially allows multiple interpreters, mul multiple interpreter threads to run in parallel without incurring any additional performance penalties. Uh, so it solves the GIL problem without actually having to remove the GIL. Uh, <laughs> and now for some contention stages. Uh, so th the problem isn't actually the GIL with all of these problems. The problem is that you, you really, okay, so I have this problem. I either want to like serve as many clients as I can with the least amount of hardware, or I've got like a lot of data to the process and I want to do it um, in the shortest amount of time. The actual problem is that I want to exploit my hardware as efficiently as I can uh, with a reasonable amount of development effort. So, you know, you can always go down into C and C++, but I, I kind of like slumming around in Python. Uh, and it would be nice if I didn't have to pay the cost of uh, being limited to one core. Um, so it did start as a proof of concept. I, uh, I had an offline email thread with Guido where uh, I actually did a, uh, if, you, if you Google for um, the word pep async, there's a pep async.txt in the, the HD Python repo that was just a crazy like rambling of what I thought Pi Parallel would be before I even had the word Pi Parallel, uh, before I'd even like really gotten into the details of the CPython interpreter. Uh, and I remember sending that to Guido and uh, he, he rightly sort of came back and he's like, I don't know if you've stopped taking your medication or you've started taking new medication, uh, but like you're just, what like, what do you want? So it's interesting. And that was like, if you're gonna be motivated to like <laughs> do something, it's when Guido says you can't. Uh, so yeah, it started as a proof of concept. Uh, and it went, I mean, it took, like it, was, it wasn't, easy work. Uh, it took uh, about three months of working on it full time. Uh, the, the actual concept though, it, uh, it, it, it became apparent that it was going to work out within the first week or two. Uh, and then there's just a lot of, you know, uh, refining since then. No, it's not refining. There's like a lot of implementation to do. Um, but I am, I'm like, I'm, especially these past, having logged about 50 hours on it in the past three days, uh, I really am convinced that this is like the best way for, for Python to stay relevant within the next 20 years. Uh, so there's, I want to use this quote, there's, there's this, there was this epic Reddit uh, post to, to game dev, I guess. Uh, describe what you're developing for each console uh, you've ever developed was like. And there was this epic uh, reply that, I, I won't read the details, but the thing that, part, this, that always stuck out to me when I read this was everything, so he's talking about the development of the PS2 and software, doing software development for the PS2. Um, and this everything requires black backflips through invisible blades of segfault, which I, it's always stuck with me. Uh, and I kind of feel like that's Pi Parallel, the early days. Like considering what I was trying to do and have all these threads run in a, essentially a non-thread safe interpreter. Uh, that being said, that is still applicable. 17th of August, so today that is, still it's it's still a lot of backfold uh the the seg faults that i get now are because of my code not because of fundamental problems in the concept so i am it is you know it, it's improving 
Uh, so the motivation behind Pi Parallel. So what pro problem was I trying to solve? Uh, and it's essential to sort of understand how Pi Parallel, like where all this comes from, because the uh, there's a lot of existing ways of approaching this solution that uh, I, I don't think adequately are actually trying to solve the problem. So the compute options for parallel, okay, so I can't, you know, the gil prevents me from just using the like raw threads, so I've got to do them separate Python processes, and that's just clunky and kind of annoying. Uh, concurrency options, when you're dealing with um, like IO and network bound stuff, you've got one thread per client blocking IO models. Uh, it all tends to be single threaded with an event loop and a multiplexing system. Uh, the problem is, that, like, what if I'm IO bound and I'm compute bound? So, uh, like, I'm a consultant, so I spend work, uh, like, I spend my day job uh, on client sides, dealing with, like, lots of data and, and a lot of computation to do. So I've got a lot of uh, computationally bound uh, work to do against these, like, terabytes and petabytes of data. Uh, and I would prefer to do it in Python, because I'm more um, productive like that. So, or, you know, I want to serve, like, tens of thousands of network clients, uh, which would be IO driven, with non-trivial computation for each incoming request. Uh, so you, you have the switch between being I/O bound from a latency perspective, um, or and then you know going to compute bound and then I/O bound again, uh, or servicing few clients but providing the, the ultra low latency. Um, so contemporary data center hardware, I've got I, we've got servers at work. The the base sort of issue for our lab servers is 128 cores and uh, half a terabyte of RAM. Uh, they've got quad 10 gig Ethernet NICs coming up. Uh, SSDs and Fusion I.O. style is just ridiculous. You can get uh, like gigabytes per second uh, right and reason. Basically, you, you're, oh, you're breaking the, dun, dun, dun. Maybe I should stop whacking that. All right, uh, yeah. And then uh, in the, I guess, two years from now, you're getting uh, 20, so the new fiber channel standard will facilitate 25 gigabytes a second. Uh, so I've got, you know, I've got a lot of this uh, data and, and you know, otherwise, and I've got really powerful hardware. I want to, like, there's no point of buying that hardware if you're not going to, to exploit it optimally. So what is optimal hardware use? And it necessitates things like I need one active thread per, so this is where it gets, uh, I guess contentious from the perspective of, I guess, the ideas that I'm uh, um, pitching for, for going about how to solve these problems, they, they tend not to be conventional in the sense of like the standard um, like ePoll and KQ and all that sort of stuff. Uh, so just keep that in mind because it's, it it's pretty bold statements, but it's, uh, it'll make sense later. So essentially, I want one active thread per core. I don't want to, it, a context switch is that's, that's lost computation time. I don't really want to have any unnecessary duplication of all my shared and common data. So the thing that always annoys me about multiprocessing, especially if I've got non-trivial problems, uh, is that I need to like start it up and then just say I need to load like a, a, um, a binary search tree or something that's like going to occupy a couple of gigs in memory and then use that to process my data. With multiprocessing, every process gets one of those. So if I, if I wanted to avoid that, I'd have to use shared memory and then there's like different interfaces between Linux and Windows and it's just a bit of an un annoyance. Uh, and I, you know, I want to be able to saturate the bandwidth of all these I.O. devices that I have connected. Uh, and I want to do it all in Python, and I still want to be competitive against C and C++ where it matters. So that's the, there's like 80 more slides of that boring like lecturing stuff. So I figured I'd like spice it, and it's a, nice, it's a small room, so this might work better. So what do you want to see next? We can do a, a live demo. Uh, benchmarks, more slides. I've got 70 more in this deck and 154 in the other deck. Uh, Q&A, or exclamation points. So, uh, demo. demo? Ex yeah, I, oh, yeah. Really, no more slides? Oh, man. All right. So, oh, uh, disclaimer, this seg faults a lot right now. Uh, so you are gonna see a lot of crashes. Uh, but in between those crashes, it's like really, really fast. So, uh, <laughs> hmm. I think that's like the best way to describe it. So what you're looking at now, we've got, uh, so this is in my little Windows VM. Uh, so I actually took a snapshot of like everything that I got working as of about 1 p.m. today. Uh, just like batch uploaded the entire thing to GitHub. So if you go to github.com, uh, pyparallel slash release, I think it up, I uploaded it to. Um, and I, yeah, like literally like, including all like the development files, just ever, like zipped up the entire directory. Uh, and I also have got a, a, a non-Git version that I've zipped up as well. So this is all available, and these little bat helper files are included and all that sort of stuff. So I wanted to, rather than just you know keep going on the lecture trail and you know 
touting the benefits of it. I wanted to provide some way of making it at least a little bit repeatable. If you try it out, it will crash. I am going to guarantee that it will. If it's not crashing, that's actually a bug. Uh, so it will, it will crash. Uh, and I really wouldn't recommend it. For, I, I kind of wanted to get to the point today where we could actually host our uh, Pi, Pi, Pi Parallel website on this, on Azure, uh, so running on Windows um, with Pi Parallel. That was a little bit too ambitious. Uh, so there is no website at the moment. There will be soon. Um, right, so we've got on the left, we've got uh, a normal Python HTTP server. So that's literally just calling the new Python 3-like uh, HTTP server module. For Pi Parallel, I basically took that, used it as a guide, and then wrote a Pi Parallel uh, friendly version of that. So it's essentially running the same code uh, and you know doing the same logic. Um, and what I will do, so the one on the left that should align with. God, there's so much crap here. Let's clear up the screen a bit. That and that and that, and we can hide that. So there's a. This thing called work uh, that I am using to do essentially like connection benchmarking. So this will start, uh, actually let's have a look what it starts. So it's like connection, eight connections over two threads for a duration of 10 seconds. And then see what you get. So this is the, actually what I might do now. Man, full screen is like the worst feature ever. Oh, look at that. Even Python crashed. Uh, that's fine. That was that was Python, not mine. So Python, if I considering I've crashed like 80 times, I, I think the normal Python gets one. Oh. Uh. Alright, so we're going to do eight connections uh, for with over two threads for a duration of 10 seconds and let me get the... So the thing to look for here when this is running uh, is the performance usage. So this will... Uh, it will be like what you expect, right? It's only ever going to want, use one core. So maybe... Is that big enough? So it did... Uh, how to interpret this? So I've only I've like used this uh, tool for like a day or two, so uh, I'm not intimately familiar with all the ins and outs. Uh, but it is showing the benefits of Pi Parallel, so I'm sticking with it for now. So essentially, what we're looking at here, latency-wise, it took uh, on average 4.93 milliseconds to return to these uh, connections. Uh, all up, I did 10,000 connections at, at a rate of like a, a bit over a thousand, and I did uh, 6.92 megs. So Pi Parallel's turn. Uh, and you're about to see some imminent crashes because it's, <laughs> yeah. I just I know why it's crashing. I just haven't had the time to fix it. If that's any consolation, uh, did that just changed my font size back. All right. So port wise, this is the. I guess I should probably use the same. Eight, two, and eighty. All right. So that one's ready to run. This will should abort. Yes, abort. And then apparently if you run it again, it doesn't abort, which is uh, non-deterministic aborting, which is pretty cool. Um, so, yeah, it, yeah. So, so essentially, we're for this 10-second thing, we're using all the cores, and we've like essentially maximised our underlying hardware. Uh, now the results, obviously that wouldn't be much point if there wasn't any good to it. So you can see, okay, so the average latency is far less, so compared to, well, far less. Well, I guess at that rate it still is like a good couple of hundred percent. Mm. Yeah, so it's under half the latency. Uh, the standard deviation is a lot better, so the maximum on this one, oh, no, uh, this varies a lot. <laughs> uh, the, but yeah, it did like 3,200 instead of 1,000 requests a second. Um, that, uh, so I was developing this, um, I think there's also a limitation here on like <laughs> the fact that I'm doing it on my two VMs essentially, uh, or one, vir one physical and one virtual. Uh, when I um, played around with this at home, what I found really interesting was that, uh, so I had a couple of servers actually hit the box at the same time during the duration. One of the, the work things, so running against the Python one and then running against my one, when it was running against the Python one, Python's ability to um, reliably service those requests uh, fairly 
thank you, was uh, severely diminished across the, the course of the run. So the this one, it's like the, the architecture of it is, it's like, a, thankfully it's showing that it's, you know, it, the, this design decisions were kind of paying off. So that's a, uh, that is, look at all these boards. The board again. Um, oh, that was a good one. Whoa, look at that. <laughs> so these are all known. <laughs> Take a screenshot of that. Uh, a lot of the aborts are happening because I've got a lot of assertions in place. So it's defensive programming that's uh, much better to deal with than like just random not workings. Uh, so that's essentially pipe arrows. So how's that actually work? The um, the actual mechanisms are, are pretty simple. So the that Pi parallel server. Um, let's do this. So I did this little helper production HTTP server. So it's, yeah, it's like literally like port root. It's the exact same interface as the Python one. Uh, this is essentially the code that I would have needed to write uh, to serve a HTTP, ser like serve a, a, a over HTTP a directory. Uh, so it's, you know, it's pretty slim line. The, the, Magic all happens uh, in two places. One is the like the standard library async HTTP server uh, class. That um, rather than look at that one because it's kind of long and it's not going to look good on uh, you know it's got all like stuff on it. It's basically like the the core Python one that I took and then made it a bit more um, friendly for for PyParallel. But to actually get an appreciation for what the uh, these protocols normal look like. So you literally, like a, the the async stuff just pairs, or the pi parallel based async stuff will just pair this notion of a protocol. So like these classes are all considered to be protocols. They all use um, like verb oriented uh, callbacks, so like data received, uh, line received, connection made, that sort of stuff. Uh, you literally just like pass Python one of these and then pass it the uh, the, the protocol, which would uh, sorry, the transport, which would be the TCP IP connection, uh, and then Python takes care of everything else. The parallel stuff, that actually, what's happening is it's, it's creating separate threads, and then uh, it's kind of a whole separate topic, but the ability to um, have the C Python core interpreting in the same spot, you can, I can basically detect whether or not something is a running within a parallel context or not, uh, and it turns out that's actually a really efficient way of, of handling the whole gil problem. Rather than trying to put locks in place, you can just do something differently for parallel contexts, um, and it's it's panned out really well. So I can actually, for how much longer I got? Yeah. I think that might have been a separate presentation. <laughs> Pi parallel is it all it's cracked up to be? That was the first working title, but I was pretty happy with the progress the past couple of days, so it got a new title. Uh, parallelism. Ah. So. Here we go. I'm just going to... Sorry, how it actually works. The uh, All this code's available online. Um, I, I guess just follow like me on Twitter or, or continue my own Twitter. Uh, I didn't have time to get all the website done, so it's uh, it's still a you know pretty actively developed project by me as of the last two days. I've got a, I got one contributor earlier this year, um, and my, my aim now is to essentially make it, uh, so that was, it was quite interesting this morning, I mean, necessity is the mother of uh, invention and innovation, of just forcing myself to have something live next door to um, Python itself. So I think rather than, whereas things like PyPy require a pretty significant change in your in entire infrastructure, uh, this can really just be dropped in aside. So some modules aren't gonna work with it because they're, you know, they're doing um, like static, uh, modification of like static um, or uh, global, constants and stuff, but you know, other stuff, like as long as you adhere to some constraints, it, it'll, it'll work. So removing the gill without needing to remove the gill. Uh, so it doesn't remove the gill, it previously tried and rejected, uh, and essentially required every all these structures and, and Python intrinsic objects to uh, require fine grain locking. That's just not the, a good way to go about it. Um, new sex are expensive, I don't use STM, because uh, I don't think it's a good solution, uh, and it doesn't support th free th threading, so you can't, create your own, th and it won't automatically parallelize other code that's been written with thread stuff, um, because that's, 
the, the taking that approach, it's you're not really solving the problem of, of like I want to. Typically, your old code isn't going to be work, uh, written efficiently to to deal with these like new style problems of like infinite data and infinite things to do. Uh, so there's a main thread, main thread object. So I've got mm, I've got like seven minutes, nine nine minutes. I'm thinking uh, maybe some time for some questions. Uh, yeah. So the essentially like when um, so. Rather than just like HTTP socket stuff, it's also got an interface for just doing like arbitrary task submission and having that. So in this particular case, that like B equals A times two uh, would actually run in a separate uh, parallel context. The the work that's done there, so it becomes tricky when you've got things like uh, like if you tried to mutate a main thread object uh, from within a parallel context, that's where things get kind of tricky. So I have <laughs> it's. It's a huge topic to cover, and it's probably not uh, suitable for even trying to cover within uh, eight minutes. But uh, I have thought about it, and I've come up with a good long-term solution that requires um, essentially some changes to the backend Python interpreter to track the type of uh, memory allocations that is, is done. So for for any given pointer, we can tell uh, where it was allocated. Um, in the short term, just don't write mutate main thread stuff. There's, I, I do provide a couple of facilities for getting computation results that are done in parallel back to the main thread. Uh, and if you, it, it just makes more sense to just leverage that for now. Um, so I'm keen to you know, try and get it working and get it uh, into a point where you know, people can actually do something half useful. I'm still keen to have like pyparallel.org run off pyparallel, the, uh, the HTTP server. Um, the, so I'm gonna open up the questions now. Like I've got, I can, any particular topic, there's probably 100 slides for it, so uh, I will Leave it to you for uh, if there's any questions about yeah implementation or all those. What's your long-term goal to uh, feed it back into Python? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, which will be well, the biggest issue at the moment preventing that um, is the reliance on intrinsic Windows facilities. So, so all of PyPal, I, I kind of try and make the case that it's actually an OS level problem. Like the the OS is the only thing that can have control of like when these interrupts are coming in and when this, you know, this IO is being driven. And it's also the thing responsible for deciding whether or not a thread should be scheduled to run. So the OS is really the only thing that can make a decision of like, I have eight cores. Uh, if we can provide a way to tell the OS how much work I need to do um, and let it figure it out, it's like, okay, so th these are the things that I want to run when that worker happens. You just call me and then let's all, you know, uh, we'll all work together and, and efficiently exploit our hardware without having for me to specify, okay, I want to serve like this many connections or start this many threads, all that sort of stuff. So Windows has all of that uh, and has been architected from day one to have all of that. Linux and Unix weren't designed like that from at, at all. They all. They're all very process oriented. There's no real notion of um, doing anything. And it's all very, the IO models are completely different as well. So Windows is inherently completion based of like, here, do this and tell me when it's done. Uh, whereas Unix is very readiness based. It's like, is this ready to do? Like, can I write to this now? Can I read from this now? Nope, okay, well, I'll try again later. And that's where the whole multiplexing thing came up. So the actual, um, in terms of the solution on uh, being able to detect like main thread objects, that's all actually pretty generic. That could be done on any platform. Um, the leveraging that using the like native thread pools and stuff, that's something that until Linux has these primitives uh, it, is, is not going to be possible on Linux. But I'm still keen to have it eventually merged back uh, into the Python mainline. The nice thing about it is that it keeps Python, the actual, uh, the amount of uh, changes that are required to the actual like C Python code base are actually relatively minimal. Um, it just kind of like intercepts a few of the thread sensitive calls, like all the incref stuff, uh, and just diverts them elsewhere. And then all the complexity of how this is implemented is hidden in that area. Um, so I, yeah, who knows? The future will tell, I guess, whether or not I mentioned it. But it's like time frame wise, it's going to be like five years at least to get um, even probably into a state where it would be suitable because it's going to require a pretty fundamental change in the way Python is sort of architected. So. Awesome. But, so you want to merge it back into Python, but it doesn't support the Unix model for... The, so to do the same thing on Unix, you would need to, because Unix doesn't have the same primitives for um, uh, essentially managing all of that, you'd need to like write your own thread pools, you'd need to manage your own concurrency levels and make sure, or like make an attempt to ensure that, okay, I've only got eight cores, really I should only be scheduling eight threads. That just, that model just really is, isn't particularly easy to implement on Unix. They don't have the IO primitives to, to facilitate doing that. So that's one side of it. The actual side of like, once I'm in this parallel thread, 
uh, that's all pretty platform independent. Like there's no like system, there's no Windows um, facilities that are required for that. So the it's it, it'll be interesting to see what it comes like. If if my argument of like okay the these pro, like you, you don't actually just want to remove the gill. You want to like solve your problem. Your problem is okay. I need to either like read network requests really fast or I need I've got big files that I want to read quickly. Uh, that sort of necessitates an I/O oriented. Um, model where you're switching, you know, efficiently between. Okay, I need to like write huge amounts of data and then process it in parallel, and then write huge amounts of data. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's a. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Who knows? <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, so really interestingly, so I, I really like Christian Tismer. I had uh, a really good session with him when I first presented this to the Python developers uh, the year before last at uh, the, the Python conference in Santa Clara. So. His was, there's actually a lot of similarity between how he's implemented the, his ability to like remove the dependency on having the C Python stack uh, is kind of key. The, the difference with mine is that I also like leverage the native Windows facilities to, um, cause it's, it's like, there's like three lines of system call stuff where I can like magically get uh, a thread pool and then have Windows automatically call this exact thing when this like IO thing completes, and then once I'm in there, I can use just general thread awareness to figure out, okay, am I parallel thread? What's all my like thread local specific stuff? So there are there are a lot of similarities. There's and the way that I've implemented some of the uh, the heap snapshotting and rollbacking facilities, it would certainly be possible to uh, do this type of stackless thing where you just kind of like ping pong between things endlessly in something that would otherwise like kill up your stack. So. I haven't, I haven't. I've never had to use Stackless. I do know that there are certain users of it, um, but I, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a potential. So I do like the idea that. Um, so Stackless was a, a, a an ambitious project that there's a lot of similarities between what we're actually trying to do because it's going to be like a fundamental change to the uh, to the interpreter. So I'd personally be banking on this because it's even if it requires like slightly different changes to your code, like you need to like either like rewrite new code or change your libraries to, to be, you know, play nicely with PyParallel. If the end result is that, is that you can exploit all of your cores, then that's like, kind of, that's going to motivate me to like at least use Python 3, uh, which is, yeah, if we get that, it's, you know, a good start. Uh, so this, all these slides are speakerdeck.com um, slash Trent would be the place to go for those. That is not a good size view. Let's watch Trent mess around in PowerPoint. Yeah, so speakerdeck.com Trent. So that's the, the 154 one that explains the, uh, the details is, is on speaker deck as well. Um, this one that I did previously isn't yet. Any other questions? One minute ago, man, I'll never finish a talk early. Right, thank you. Thank you.